Good evening. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just resume with um, the uh, evening's second keynote by Professor Charles Taylor. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome you here. It's your first time at the Institute, and I hope we will have occasion to have you back soon. Uh, it's an especial pleasure for me for two other reasons. I was Professor Taylor's student at the University of Oxford. Um, his book on, Ta uh, on Hegel um, was my first introduction uh, to Hegel. Uh, and uh, also I have an additional connection with him now because I direct the um, IWM, the Institute of Human Sciences in Vienna. Um, as well as the Albert Hirschman Center for Democracy, which is hosting uh, this evening's conference. Professor Taylor is uh, a permanent fellow at the IWM since many, many years, and he runs a program on religion and secularism there. So there are many ties which bind me to him, and it's a great pleasure, therefore, to welcome him here at the Institute. He is uh, among the most influential writers in contemporary uh, philosophy. His work uh, spans the uh, areas of political philosophy, philosophy of social sciences, the history of philosophy, intellectual history, with some 20 books and over 500 articles. It's been translated into French, German, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, and Turkish. He's probably, I think, the social scientist, if we may count philosophers among us, who has won the most amount of prestigious awards in uh, the last years. Starting with the Templeton Prize 2007, the Kyoto Prize for Lifetime Achievement, the uh, Klug Prize, which he shared with Jürgen Habermas, and uh, last but not least, the Bergun Prize, which he won last year. Uh, that reflects in a small way the you know, acclaim and the respect in which his work is held internationally. Professor Taylor started his professional career at, uh, as a fellow at All Souls College, Oxford, then as a professor at McGill University, and then he held the Chair of Social and Political Theory at Oxford. His first major work, The Explanation of Behavior, is based on his dissertation written with uh, Isaiah Berlin and is a, a powerful critique of behaviorism in the social sciences, which was really the dominant paradigm at that time. In his seminal work, Sources of Self, The Making of Modern Identity, he argued that humans are self-defining or self-interpreting animals, and that paradoxically, to be human is not to know what it is by nature to be human. He analyzed the applications of moral choice and Western ethical history to reveal a variety of moral visions and concluded by suggesting that purely humanistic, secular sources of inspiration may not be enough or may not be able to sustain important values such as universal benevolence. Consequently, he espoused a return to some kind of spirituality in the modern world as this holds, in his view, the most promise for maintaining a moral society. His work has examined, among other things, what has led scholars to assume that modern society and religious spirituality are incompatible, and as it has explored the possibility that there therefore may be very many different ways of being modern in the world. In a book that is as timely as it is timeless. His book on Hegel, I just mentioned before, really had a profound impact on the field. In fact, at a time, I think, when Hegel had gone completely out of fashion. And one of the really fascinating things for me about uh, this book as a graduate student was the fact that it brought home to me the um, idea with the argument that Professor Taylor made that 
In fact, Hegel could really help us understand the modern times in which we live, particularly our conceptions of modern freedom and agency. More recently, he has been concerned with thinking about issues of multiculturalism, also the place of religion in secular societies. These are some of the key questions and problems for all modern democratic polities. In his monograph, A Secular Age, he asks a very fundamental question. What is secularism and what does it mean to live in a secular society? His two most recent books, two years ago, um, Retrieving Realism, is a radical critique of Cartesian um, epistemic views, which have dominated philosophy for long. And it restores a realist view, affirming our direct access to the everyday world and to the physical universe through our bodily engagement with it. And he emphasizes the fact that this engagement this way of uh, understanding the world is a shared and not just an individual experience. His last book, written, I think, uh, came out last year, The Language Animal, The Full Shape of Human Linguistic Capacity, demonstrates that language is at the center of uh, the process, and it, it helps us create possible ways of being both as individuals and as a society. But I, before I give you the word, I do want to mention something about uh, your contribution to public life because like Albert Hirschman, but in a very different way, you've had uh, an enormous amount of engagement in democratic politics, a civic engagement which has run parallel to your intellectual life. You were an active member of the Social Democratic New Democratic Party in Canada and ran as a candidate of the party in federal elections on three occasions in 1960. In 1965, Professor Taylor lost the election to the newcomer and the future Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau. One can imagine what may have happened if that electoral decision would have gone otherwise. In 2007, he was asked by the Premier of Quebec to co-chair the commission to write a white paper on how to accommodate differences in a multicultural polity. But let me conclude by going back to your doctoral years. We have a lot of our doctoral students here, and we may want to share a secret with them. The years between 1956 and 61, when he was a doctoral student at Oxford, he probably spent less time on his doctoral dissertation than he should have, because he did three other things. One, he was asked by J.L. Austin, as a graduate student, who gave him the thankless task of briefing the Austin Circle about the work of Merleau-Ponty. This was probably a hopeless task to try to convince analytical philosophers in Oxford that continental philosophy was even worth reading. And yet it has not daunted you because you've continued your whole life to try and build a bridge between Anglo-American analytical philosophy and continental philosophy. You've been a good friend and interlocutor to Habermas and later to Foucault while remaining in a productive dialogue with the late Rawls, Rorty, and Bernard Williams. And this is, of course, I think, uh, an enormous achievement. But during these years, when he was writing or not writing his PhD, something that he did which has had a lasting and an extremely successful influence, and that is he founded the journal The New Left Review with Stuart Hall, Ralph Samuels, Gabriel Person, and later on with E.P. Thompson. And then it was Charles Taylor who mentored and tutored the even younger Perry Anderson then on how to manage the New Left Review as you yourself left to go back to Montreal. And finally, and that brings me to 
the kind of civic engagement I think that we would badly need in Europe today. The year is 1956. It is the year in which 150,000 Hungarian refugees enter Vienna. And it is the year in which Professor Taylor spent his time in Vienna helping to process the documents of these refugees who both settled in Austria and passed through it. So you would be an ideal person to talk about the problems that democracies face today. You've chosen a pessimistic topic, democracy and degeneration. It resonates with the theme of our conference, disenchantments with democracy. But I think, as I know you, you may want to end on an optimistic note. <laughs> Thanks to Shalini for that very, very kind introduction. And what have I already dropped here? Something, well, something not relevant to the talk, so it doesn't matter at the moment. Yeah, I have, in one way, unimpeachable, uh, as it were, uh, let's say, grounds for being able to speak about democracy with insight, in that I ran for parliament four times, actually, and was defeated every time. So <laughs> there's a certain vision of all this from, from this angle where you see things that uh, <clears throat> you don't otherwise see. You should hear, it's too late to invite Pierre Trudeau to tell you what it looks like from the other angle, but you do get insights from this angle. So. I want to talk about democratic degeneration. And I realized when I looked at the title, this is a terribly depressing title. I expect everyone to leave the room almost immediately. And I am going to say some depressing things at the beginning, so prepare your handkerchiefs. To, but I, as Shalini said, I really want to come to a point through all this where we can perhaps begin to see what, what can be done. But, the reason for this first period of, of, of downer, if you like, is that I think we, and definitely me for a while, have been tempted by what I call the escalator theory of history, that somehow we're guaranteed that light and enlightenment and sweetness and so on, and therefore democracy will gradually advance, maybe stop for a while, but then advance further, but not regress. And what I would like to argue is that there is built into our democracy directions of regression which are very hard to avoid. I mean, just as the human organism is susceptible to catch various diseases, so our democracies, by their very nature, are susceptible to slide back and <clears throat> go backwards, and that in several respects. And so this is going to be interesting in relation to Shiryas no, uh, earlier because it's going to cover some of the same terrain but somewhat from a somewhat different angle. The angle is understanding democracy as, if you like, a cultural form and what that, what that kind of uh, nature of democracy, I'm going to put this here, so, um, what that kind of democracy uh, introduces as dangers. All right, so I want to look at three directions or three axes of degeneration, and you could think of more. I mean, if you really were out to make everyone feel totally uh, depressed, I could invent more, but fortunately there isn't time to go on forever. So let me talk about these three. The first is the danger of sliding into what I want to call elite rule. Now, why this is important, uh, why, what role it plays in democracy, I think we can see if we start off with a little history of the word. Because what's interesting is that we all think democracy is the highest form today, but 200 years ago, and up to 200 years ago, it was a negative term. And why was it a negative term? Well. Because if you go back to Aristotle, and you know, philosophers think that all knowledge starts with uh, Aristotle, if you go back to Aristotle and in Greek, uh, you know, uh, Greek uh, democracy or Greek polis in general, democracy meant rule by the demos, 
that is the common people, that is the non-elites, at the expense of and riding roughshod over the, the elites, right? Just as oligarchy was the opposite, ruled by the elites and noble and rich elites at the expense of the demos, so the ideal society for Aristotle was a kind of balance of these two, where neither can ride over the other, and they have to negotiate with each other, which he called the uh, politeia. Politeia, of course, just meant constitution, but it's also the word, you know, the famous work of Plato called the uh, Republic. Well, that was called in Greek politeia. So it can also be seen as the, the Republic. And, of course, even the founders of the USA at the, at the moment of founding still shared this earlier view. No, no democracy, because that would be the common people who would undermine property by uh, you know, voting for cheap money and, and so on. So we, they wanted something else, and they called it uh, the Republic, right? Now, what happened when 25 years later we begin a, uh, a period in the West where that ideal balanced society becomes, comes to be called democracy. And we completely forget that earlier period where it was a kind of bad word. It's now our good word. But I think within that is hidden, you might say, a kind of double mind, double understanding of what democracy means, which comes out when you look at the double, under double meaning in almost all modern European languages of the word people. The word people, on one hand, means the ensemble of the population of a nation, right? But the word people also is used sometimes for what the Greeks called the demos, or the Latin, the Romans called the plebs, right? So you have laos and demos, you have, you have populus and, and uh, plebs, right? These two senses of the word. And why are they in play? Well, they're in play, they can be seen as lying behind two ways of defining democracy, two ways of seeing if something is a democracy. One, you might call the, bring Schumpeter, you know, as it were, invoke him as the definer of this first one. A country is a democracy when the people as a whole are free, they can have free and fair elections, when they're not, in other words, dominated by a dictatorship or dominated from outside. And that's a democracy. There's another sense where we speak of democracies, which are formerly democracies in that first sense, as more or less democratic. And I think there what we have in mind is democracy is what I want to call a telic concept. That is a concept which gives us an ideal. The ideal being an ideal in which there is real equality between elite and non-elites. In other words, where the non-elites play the full role that their numbers uh, require or justify in the life of the democracy. Now, I would like to, to say that this Thiele concept, like all Thiele concepts, really we use with the sense that it may never happen. Or if it does happen, that we actually achieve that we can easily slide away from it. It's something, it's a compass. So I would like to argue that, I think we can look at some of our history and see this, that the whole temper of a democracy, when it's lived as this Thiele concept by the people concerned, changes. There's moments when we feel we're advancing forward to becoming more democratic. This is particularly the case, of course, at the moments when, when democracies are founded and the <clears throat> sort of Tahrir Square moments and beyond. Well, unfortunately, that didn't entirely work out. But those kind of moments. But it's also uh, true later on when, after a long period of elite rule, you have something more, a more equal society being built. I'm thinking of, for instance, the most recent such positive period in our history in the West, we could say from the 30s in some cases and after the war in many other cases, the building of the modern welfare state, um, uh, redistributive taxation, some degree of, of control of, of, uh, of, of the economy, 
and, and, and so on. In that period, let's say 45 to 75, les trente glorieuses, as the French call them, you have the sense that, yes, the, the fuller democracy, we're coming closer to the ideal. And I think you can say that in the period, let's say after 75 and 80, we have a movement in the opposite direction and the, the beginnings of a demoralization of a sense of, of uh, disenchantment, uh, this word that we use for our meeting today, grows, right? So that is the claim I'd like to make that, that uh, this concept operates as that, in that way like a kind of uh, telos, like a kind of ideal that we should be living and we either feel, yes, we're moving towards it, and we're energized, or we feel no, we're being we're sliding away from it, and various things happen. Now, why do I talk about this as a dangerous degeneration? Because, like the other two, I want to talk about in a minute. This axis of degeneration is in danger of it anyway of having a kind of self-feeding character. That is, so you get in this period, 75 to today in Western democracies, index of <clears throat> a decline in what I want to call felt citizen efficacy, an, an index of, in other words, the sense that, yes, we, ordinary people, we can do something, we know what to do, we know who to vote for, has declined. And in all sorts of ways, that kind of decline can enter can loops, self-feeding loops. For instance, people therefore very often don't vote, they stop voting, right? And since they stop voting, then obviously the power of money in politics increases, which increases, deepens the sense of disenchantment, which could easily lead to less voting again. And you get it kind of spiral downward. Another facet of this spiral has been that for a lot of people, the political system has become more opaque. It's not clear, it's clear what causes what. And this is uh, part of uh, a complex development, some aspects of which have been very, very positive. But what made the political system more transparent or more seemingly responsive to one's own intervention let's see, in the 45 to 75 period, was that in many Western democracies, you have a kind of polarization between a right, center right, as we would say today, and center left party. So if the issues were, let's have a better welfare state, let's have more control over the economy, you know that you would, if you wanted to go that way, you'd vote well, labor or whatever. If you wanted to go this way, you'd vote Tory or uh, you know, different parties in different, in different societies. Whereas Western democracy since then has seen a tremendous development of different movement, social movements, most of which have been tremendously positive, right? The feminist movement, the gay rights movement, the ecological movements and so on, but has had the effect of, in a certain extent, fragmenting the party system so that it's less clear how one can have an effect on it. So you get two developments which tend to intensify themselves. One, the sense that, well, you can't really control the situation, you can't really do anything, so people drop out. Or their, if you like, their citizenship begins to wither and they begin to behave more like resident aliens. I mean, they don't, you know, hope we can find a way to live here decently, but we can't really control the situation. And at the same time, the sense of, there's a kind of, I don't know, the word dumbing down is unfortunate, maybe too dismissive, but there is this, people have a less and less clear idea of what causes what. So that in the extreme case, which we've close to arrived at now, you can have a major leader of a Western democracy saying, trust me and I'll make uh, X great, I mean, with name your country, uh, uh, <clears throat> and people buy it. Or maybe they don't buy it, maybe they're so despairing <laughs> that they'll just use it as a symbolic slap in the face for the elites. But in any case, you have the kind of opacity of the, uh, of, of the system. So you have, 
in that way a kind of uh, slide which which threatens to become self-feeding. It's in other words, is some see some errors in systems. This is supposed to happen in the economic system with the market are self-correcting. The market isn't always self-correcting, but it, anyway, in theory, it is. But this is a kind of slide which which threatens to be self-enforcing, self-increasing, not self-correcting. Now, I, the last thing I want to say about this, though, because it's very important, is that this really is a deep sort of wound or uh, creates a great malaise. And you can see this decline of felt citizen efficacy. And you can see that in the way in which people will respond to what looked like looks like ways out. And I'm thinking of the great campaign of Obama in 2008, right? <coughs> yes, we can. See, what, what is the, what's the situation in which the slogan, yes, we can, has real punch, real hold? Well, the situation in which, no, we can't, is the major sense that people have. And this is really a painful sense, right? There's something that people would like to get around. And I note that one of the parties that emerges out of the Indigados movement in Spain is Podemos, right? Yes, we can. I mean, it's the same sort of idea. So we have here something that's, that's very painful and also something that makes people susceptible to a certain kind of, kind of hope, right? So that's the first major axis of degeneration that I'd like to talk about. But I want to talk about three because they are now happening in a connected way in our world and we have to face them in a connected fashion. The second one is one in which the, if you like, the common identity that people have as members of a, of, of a democracy get in some ways deviated into a, a more restricted definition, right? Now, common uh, identity that we have as you know, Quebecois, Canadians, uh, Genevans, uh, Frenchmen, uh, British, and so on, is extremely important. I think this is part of the culture of democracy that we must never forget. Extremely important for democracies because this sense of being bond <clears throat> bonded around that identity is what allows free, free societies to function. You're not, as it were, bound to do what you're supposed to do because the big brother is there watching you or, <clears throat> or the, you're going to be heavily punished. You've got, in a free society, you have to be motivated to participate, participate in voting, participate sometimes even in, in military action, to redistribute, uh, redistribute income very often from more fortunate to less fortunate. This is a kind of very powerful kind of, of sharing. And also to have mutual trust. There has to be a sense that when we're all talking in the election time about our future and deciding whether we go this direction or that direction, that all of you are thinking about the common good, including me, including me or our group. In other words, as soon as you find in a modern democracy developing the idea that that, let's say, that majority there are not really thinking of us when they're talking about the common good, but they think of us as outsiders, you get the basis for an independentist movement, for precisely that reason that that trust disappears. And I, <clears throat> I know what I'm talking about because I come from an area of the world where that kind of movement has been very, very active. The whole claim of the independentists is that <clears throat> they don't care. <clears throat> They're not really interested in us. They're not interested in our welfare. They're interested in theirs, and they'll <clears throat> happily do it at our expense. So you can see how this kind of unity is very important. I would give you another example which I think illustrates this. The fact that in the European Union, which I think is one of the most fascinating, hopeful, and interesting uh, experiences, attempts to create something new in our world, 
has never been able to have a full sense that it's operating as a deliberative community, right? So really important issues can't be decided by the European Parliament. The vote for the European Parliament is much less than the vote for the national parliaments of various countries. <clears throat> there is a sense of distance from Europe, which of course has fed into various populist movements that have, that have tried to, or there are, some tried and succeeded, unfortunately, some threatened to withdraw from Europe. And the reason for this is that there is not this sense of, yeah, we're all in it together, right, in the European case. I mean, this is something that's very interesting because it's right now we have in, with Macron the attempt to change this. He really wants to have a debate, anyway, in the whole Eurozone about how the Eurozone should be run in common with maybe a <clears throat> Eurozone finance minister and so on. And he's inviting, he's inviting uh, Angela Merkel to join him in a series of proposals which would have a Europe, which would trigger off a Europe-wide discussion about this Europe, European issue. That, if that works, and I'm not making any promises, but if that works, then it would change that. But the fact is, up to now, it hasn't, <clears throat> it hasn't been possible to take European representative institutions like the, the Strasbourg Parliament and make them the center of decisions that will actually hold, that we go this way rather than that way. This is another illustration of the great necessity of, if you like, national sentiment. <clears throat> <clears throat> Here I'm echoing a point that's been very eloquently made by Craig Calhoun, who be who I don't may not be talking about tomorrow, but which who will be talking to you tomorrow. Well, now what's the degenerative danger? Oh, merci. <laughs> the degenerative danger here is that these common identities can slide into, uh, if you like, a partial definition which excludes people, and that's. Let's look at this. There are these common identities of modern democracies have always two sides. They have, a, if you like, moral or principled side that our republic is based on democracy, universal human rights, non discrimination, and so on and so on. But they also have a particular side that we Quebecois, or we Canadians, or we Americans, or we Frenchmen, and so on are engaged in the particular project, particular historical project, which is ours, of realizing these principles. And this is, I mean, think this idea of the particular historical project is really the basis of the patriotism. It's, it's, uh, I mean, that's what I think, what I think Habermas meant to mean about Telfasting's patriotism, right? Constitutional patriotism, I'm not sure if he did, but, that's what, <laughs> but I think that's the sense that I can, can make of it. Now, <clears throat> it's possible because of this, these two that were sides, the moral and the particular, it's possible to move towards a narrowing in either of these dimensions. For instance, there can be a moralistic restriction who, who really is, belongs to our society. Example was Mitt Romney in the previous, this last, uh, presidential election, who I think probably threw it away because he made a speech which he thought was in private, but it was in, came out in public, saying, you know, 40 percent of the U.S. population were really sort of passengers uh, drawing from the system and not really contributing to the system. And uh, there you have an expression of a certain idea of what it is to be an American, I mean, self-reliant, not asking for help from the government and so on, <clears throat> which is a, a, a utterly unrealistic as a, as a general, as a totally general rule, but nevertheless, that's, a, that's the ethos. And this kind of ethos can, be, can lie behind various attempts that you find sometimes governments in the states, Republican governments in all levels, try to suppress votes among the groups of people that they consider to be a danger to their power. And, <clears throat> but of course, what that could be a purely cynical operation in one way is. In another way, it's helped along by this kind of moralistic slide, 
where you think, well, they aren't some real American citizens in the full meaning of the act. They aren't living up to it, right? So you get a deviation on the moral dimension in which the people that are considered really belonging to the community cease to be the whole community. Another deviation which can go along with it is on the, if you like, particularistic side, who belongs to this particular historical attempt to realize a democracy. And there are all sorts of reasons why it can be, you know, it can be people of a particular ethnic uh, group. It can be people who are considered to be really historically involved for a long time as against these recent arrivals. Uh, there can be exclusions of a very complex form as you'd find in the United States, you kind of uh, un un unspoken precedence rules about rich whites, poor whites, and then non-whites and so on, <clears throat> who deserve you know, treatment first or most, most treatment. That kind of um, presumption entering in leads to another kind of restriction where some people are really first class citizens and others aren't. Now, this is, of course, very, very, not only very, very dangerous, undermining, dividing, weakening a democracy, but it also uh, contains the seeds of one of these self-feeding operations. That is, <clears throat> sense of resentment arises on both sides about this. The gulf gets deeper. Incidents occur, like you know, policing incidents in the United States, for instance, in which the the gulf is is dug deeper and uh, <clears throat> and and deeper. So. There's a danger of, of self-feeding here. Now, how this reacts, interacts with the first of my degenerations I'm talking about, the slide towards elite rule and the sense that we're not being treated properly, we're not being, our interests are not being listened to, the need to rebel against that can be captured by this second kind of narrowing where the demos, the non elites that one is fighting for, <clears throat> is redefined in this restrictive fashion. And this is what we're looking at almost, almost everywhere in the current Western world. That is, the definition of the demos to be defended against certain kinds of elites which are doing terrible things, not defending our interests, but among the terrible things these elites are doing is favoring other people that ought to be given second, second row, as it were. <clears throat> they are given, on the contrary, the uh, first uh, attention. And so we can see how these two kinds of two kinds of degeneration are not only individually on their own in danger of, as it were, feeding on themselves and intensifying, they also combine in a very, very dangerous way. Because not only <clears throat> is this mobilizing of the demos in this partial fashion, something that deeply divides and weakens the society, but also it, isn't, it doesn't have any hope at all, doesn't hold, hold out any hope at all of rectifying the disadvantaged sense that people have, which made them feel in the first place that they were being mistreated, as it were, by elites. They, for instance, in all the cases that many of the cases we're looking at in the Western world, in the US and in France, so on, you get the populist building on a sense of deprivation of, in, in rust belts, in areas that have been earlier on very prosperous uh, with workers with steady jobs and so on, where that has been lost, and the entire sense of grievance and the need somehow to rectify this gets channeled into this kind of, if you like, narrowed populism, which, as I said, not only divides the society, but offers really no hope of rectifying the situation, rectifying the, the, the deprivation in, in the first place. So you get these two can operate together. Now, there's a third one that I think <clears throat> we have to factor in here. A third kind of degeneration democracy is potentially heir to, which is sliding into being understood as majority rule. 
What this means is that the people were trying to vote against, the people were trying to vote out of power, the people were trying to vote out of power, and the people that they are favoring don't really belong to the demos. Huh? They don't really belong to the demos, and they don't really belong to the people. They're sort of semi-outsiders. So there we have the, uh, a very dangerous breakdown, because democracy in the full sense here is supposed to be the locus of a collective deliberation involving everyone. The key thing about democracy is the possibility of collective common deliberation, which requires that however much you disagree, you take your interlocutor or your opponent, your adversary, as also a discussion partner, is also someone who has to be convinced, or people have to be convinced not to vote for him, but as part of a debate. Once democracy slides into an understanding of itself as majority rule, that disappears. These are just enemies. They have to be put out of, out of commission. They have to be put out of operation. There's no question of our somehow <clears throat> having to talk to and convince them. And this is a third degeneration which is arising in our <laughs> modern Western societies. I think you can see it arises on the back of the first two. It's something that, that the first two lend themselves to, particularly the second I'm talking about, the narrowing of the demos. I mean, why do we talk to people who aren't members of the people, part of the people, <clears throat> after all? But this has been made particularly difficult by certain developments in the public sphere and in the media that keep that embody the public sphere, keep the public sphere alive. And this is not necessarily connected to uh, <clears throat> that kind of bad populism itself, but it's something that's arising in our, in our time. That whereas media used to be mainly print media and then print and electronic, and now print is well, not exactly declining, but it's taking electronic forms. I mean, you still, when you get the Guardian, you still read something, uh, but you get it on the, <clears throat> over the internet. You don't go and buy it on the, um, on the newsstand. Well, the, there used to be a situation in which there were more or less common, important media, important newspaper, national newspaper or newspapers, uh, important television uh, stations and so on, where the differences were, as it were, debated, argued, and so on, so that everybody had access to both sides. And now we have this creation of what people call echo chambers, where there are certain media that just totally uh, invent or <laughs> have their own world and don't ever allow information or arguments from the other world to enter except in totally caricatured forms. And this, is, this echo chamber effect has been somehow very worryingly uh, emphasized or made more uh, worse, worsened by the importance of social media. Now, the people communicating in Facebook and other kinds of social media with, with each other, which also can have the effect of immuring you and your friends in your particular communication circle and there, very frighteningly, in the last US election, we saw that not only opinions circulate, which are all the same opinion and don't listen to other opinions, but even factoids that are totally without any basis circulate and are never in any way refuted. People don't even know, as they're in that particular social media circle, that somewhere else someone has shown that this didn't happen or is to totally absurd or it doesn't have any basis in, in fact. So we have this third kind of degeneration, which is partly spin-off from the first two, but partly has its own, has its were worsening factors, worsening uh, conditions, which are in developing independently. It's something to do with the development of, of media. OK, so everybody is now very depressed. And how, so let's turn around and see. I think 
it helps to get depression. See this because I think one could begin to see how it can be combated. And I hope I don't have too much time now because I don't have answers to many of these questions, but I have <clears throat> but I have beginnings, just slight beginnings of hints of how we might move in these various directions. Well, if I mean looking at the present wave of I would say bad populism. Instantly, I think you know, it's a good populism. And I mean, a populism where without that kind of narrowing of the demos, you have objections by people who have been disadvantaged and a, a real demand that they be listened to. I mean, you know, Bernie Sanders is against Donald Trump, maybe. Uh, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but the, the, the existence of bad populism, as we now know it, is in different societies the res joint result of the sense of being totally neglected and nobody taking care of your interests on the part of elites who perhaps believed too much in neoliberalism and didn't see the need that, that global trade and, and uh, automation created for finding jobs for people who, are, who lost their jobs. Yeah. No, it, the combination of that with this kind of appeal to these partial identities has in many cases produced very powerful results. In the French case uh, around Le Pen, in many European cases, the, but the combination and the sort of flavor of the particularistic, as it were, narrowing of the, of the demos is different in each case. That is what what is the particular kind of cultural discomfort that, for instance, attempts to brand people as outsiders uh, takes can be very different. I mean, you know, I, I have to admit, frankly, that there I'm operating on very narrow experience. We all are. I'm thinking, you guessed it, I'm thinking of, of Quebec. I'm thinking of the sense that this population, which has struggled for over two centuries to maintain the French language and a sense of survival, the, of the difficulties of survival, the way that very strange for all the different immigrants can be depicted as a, a threat to this. You know, est-ce qu'ils vont nous changer? Well, that's what they ask the community. Will, will they change us? And I think you have something of the same in the German case. But it can be rather different in the French case, where it depends, you know, the, one of the terrible issues there is that a big part of the Muslim population is North, North African, particularly Algerian, and there's been a terrible history of the <coughs> French-Algerian relations, if that's the right word, over centuries, so that certain, certain issues arise out, out, of, out of history. So it's different in different places, not only the weighting of the economic deprivation as against, as it were, cultural discomfort may be different. I think in the case of Germany, it's <clears throat> probably different, very different, certainly than the case of France, but also the particular kind of cultural discomfort you need the sort of individual language of the particular society to get at it. So it's, it's hard to, to get at, but in general, how could one conceive a kind of counter, counter offensive to this kind of threat to democracy? Well, first of all, you would need some kind of believable program to relieve the sense of deprivation and loss that, for instance, a lot of workers in Rust Belts have. And that's not necessarily that easy. I, mean, I mentioned Bernie, but I don't think Bernie had a lot of uh, you know, detailed answers to this. And this is made particularly difficult. Now I'm getting into the uh, re, re descent into the depressing zone, but this is made particularly, but then uh, let's keep struggling on. This is made particularly difficult by the fact that we are, we seem to be moving into an era where the pace of automation and the pressure of international competition is making it more and more difficult to find secure, non-precarious, full-time jobs in productive industry for all the potential workers who are looking for work. We may have to 
consider a rather radical change over time in our entire style of life and in the entire way in which we offer people, offer our populations not only the income they need, but a sense of participation and dignity as participants in the society. I mean, you could conceive of, of, of as it were, trying to face the issue of a non of a you know, less, less growth-focused society by uh, guaranteed annual income, which might economically be possible in certain circumstances where our robot-run <laughs> export economy is making enough resources to do this, but that wouldn't answer the needs that these people have for some sense of dignity, the dignity they had as, as workers. So there's a huge set of problems there. Secondly, of course, we need the kind of mobilization which we've seen in certain cases, but which we need to, uh, I would say, develop farther and connect better. You see, we, there was, in the, after 2008, this uh, tremendous movement in many countries. It took the form of Occupy in the United States, for instance. It took the form all the students in 2012, the Printemps Arabe in Quebec. It took the form of mass movements of Indignados in, in Spain. But how does this, in the end, connect to the political system so that actually something is done? I think in the case of Occupy in the States, you get a very sad example of how, you know, Occupy very close to Wall Street in protest against the modus operandi of Wall Street. Wall Street just sat there and twiddled their thumbs until people got tired of this and the police go in and they clear it out and it doesn't, in the end, connect. So the difficulty, and here I speak maybe as a old, tired, maybe I'm not tired, but old social democrat, and so how do we connect this energy to the political system so that it can actually, that is, those who are engaged in the institutions of representative democracy who can change the law, change the regulations, and so on. Second, the third big issue and difficulty is how we recreate majority coalitions, which have to be, in many cases, majority coalitions, which bridge the gap created by bad populism, right? And here, I think, we, have to, we are very, very tempted. We, liberal, universalists, and so on, we're tempted to despair. We're tempted, I mean, I'm very much related to what Sheila Justinov was saying, earlier, simply to say these people are rednecks, they're backward, they're <clears throat> uneducated, they're ignorant, they're, they fail the minimum test of, uh, of, the, of understanding our values. They're deplorable, in fact, if I can use a word that was very unfortunate, uh, from Hillary's campaign. And this does nothing but increase the influence of somebody who says, I'm not politically correct, and you all know what I'm talking about in that, this case. So what is the, is the answer? We just have to grit our teeth? No. The answer is that every human being has a complex identity. It has many, many facets, right? They're male or female, their parents or children, they're workers in this or workers in that. They have this kind of interest or that kind of interest. They, very every individual identity is immensely complex, and the, the the issue is how do you bring together some facets of their identity into a coalition? Example from from Quebec. After our commission, we had this very unfortunate legislation proposed by the Quebec government to forbid uh, people from you know, what they thought of as a, you know, rather strange religions like Islam from uh, wearing religious signs, as they called it. So a woman with hijab couldn't get a job in the public service would be one of the results of this. And we, of course, fought this very hard campaign against that. Now, the polls said this is called the Charter of Laïcité, Charter of Secularism. Do you, do you approve of the Charter? Right? And 50-something, even something high 50s, yes. And then somebody had the sense to make another poll. 
would you approve of people being fired on the basis of this charter? 50 plus no, I mean high plus no. Right? Okay, so you have complex identities out there, right? On one hand, they have this sense of cultural fear and they think it, they'd, be, they'd feel better if the, that kind of thing didn't happen. They didn't have to go into hospital and meet a nurse with a, with a hijab. But at the same time, you know, I'm here being very chauvinistic as a Quebecois. There really is a very strong sense of fair play and letting people live and not ruining people's lives in this population. So complex identities. You can the the opposition, we all hammered on the issue of how many combien de congédiments, how many people are going to be fired, and the thing uh, failed. I mean failed for lots of reasons. And <laughs> we weren't you know, I never had an absolutely unquestioned political victory in my life, but I'm still waiting. <clears throat> so, but you can see another example that people in the American Rust Belt, right, they have, to say I'm a male worker. I have a sense of my dignity. I used to be able to feed my children, educate my children, and now I can't anymore. Now, that male identity probably doesn't make me a feminist. It probably means that I have certain views about the uh, relative situation of black and white and so on. But that sense of if we're the dignity as a worker being frustrated, not answered, is something that we can, that, you know, a broader coalition, even in this case Bernie actually, could talk to. And that's why, as you know, the polls showed an amazing number of people who were going for Trump, and if Trump didn't, wasn't the candidate, they would go for, for Bernie. In other words, there, there are ways of bringing people into a larger coalition that's actually going to do something. That's one of the great advantages of it. That's actually going to achieve something for them. There are ways of bringing people into a larger coalition, in spite of the fact that a lot of the things that the other things that they think are pretty horrifying to other people like ourselves in that same coalition. So it's this we affront after that, <laughs> after we solve all those problems, we affront the problems of the the public sphere and its present divisions and its present ability to float free from facts and truth. I mean, I got truth free. I hope I'm running out of time uh, because <laughs> at this point, I really, yeah, maybe I will run out of time because I, I, I have such feeble uh, attempts to solve this and I have to think much longer on it. But I think we can see arising out of the diagnosis, the very depressing diagnosis in terms of these three axes of degeneration, we can see what would be required by a serious attempt which could succeed to roll them back. Right? And particularly, we're counting on the fact that this bad populism is really, objectively, a coup de sac. I mean, they're people are not leading anywhere. It's not going to lead to the problems, the solution of the problems which originally motivated people to, to take it up. And so I think what I've done is attempt to, in the light of these depressing developments, in the light of our susceptibility to these depressing developments, to look at the areas that we need to work on in order to make a successful comeback. All right, at that point, I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. So thank you very, very much. Uh, the diagnosis is depressing. I think it will be a shared depressing diagnosis. Uh, I hope people are not going to add to the depression uh, through some of the questions. But thank you at least for struggling at the end to find some optimistic answers. And maybe we can channel the discussion in that direction. But this is not a directive. Uh, the uh, floor is open. Thank, thank you, uh, P Professor Taylor. My name is John Latsis. I'm at the University of Reading, but I live here in Geneva. I, d I didn't come all that way. I would have, but I didn't have to. Um, 
so uh, I was just thinking about the the point you ended on. Um, I have questions about other parts of your talk, but um, on, on the point you ended on, what strikes me is that a, a lot of the the communicative bubble that you talked about is is enabled, maybe not entirely created, but enabled by technological developments. Um, and there's always, um, Professor Jasanoff knows this much better than I do, but there's always a, a lag between the development of new technologies and the ability of the populations using them to be able to use them effectively. So maybe a ray of hope is uh, that we need to engender in younger generations and kids, my young children's age, uh, different critical skills, different critical capacities through the education system to be able to circumvent the problems that come through the use of social media. My my generation uses the social media, but we didn't we didn't grow up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't grow up with a, We didn't yeah. grow up seeing the the, the weaknesses. Yeah. The the and 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 so we're particularly um, dangerous users of that mm. type of infrastructure, right? Know how to use it, but we don't know what the weaknesses are and we, don't, we can't exercise our critical capacities effectively. But it's just a thought. No, <clears throat> no I agree. I mean, I'm you in space because uh, when I grew up, <laughs> none of this existed and I still don't understand it. I mean, I had to be shown how to use a computer every time. So uh, I, I'm in an even worse position, but it seems to me that um, some of the other things I talked about, like the ability to mobilize lots and lots of young people to turn out in the streets. I think that the wonderful thing that Sheila Jasnoff pointed out about the Earth Day with the, one, the girl with the, <clears throat> um, the... That ability is one that can bring people back to some kind of bedrock truth, right? That, that danger that faces them. And that that is a <clears throat> one way that this kind of... Uh, fragmented, uh, fragmented me media world can can be overcome, and also that, it, by because of the impassioned nature of of these protests, some of the real factual situation can get through to people. I think lots of people that I've seen were very impressed by <clears throat> these demonstrations as long as they happened, right, and then when they disappear they can be convinced by Fox News and others and so on that the, the whole thing is a, is a mere pipe dream. So I think that there are ways to, to penetrate this jungle, but I think it also needs, as you say, because the new technologies are new, it, we have to have new ways of, it would be self-policing here, self-policing of, which are now being attempted, in other words, not all, not all, uh, things that are put up there ought to be allowed up there. Right? Or and we may have to get very, very tough in terms of monetary fines and other things with, <clears throat> with the various, uh, as it were, f providers of, of, of social media. But this is something that I would love to, th I'd like to think more before I, you know, shoot off my, from the top of my head. Oh, Professor Taylor, thanks very much. I'm Martin Krieger from Sydney, Australia. I did come all that way. Uh, and I'm very glad because wisdom is not a common academic category, but it's a very wonderful thing to listen to. But I wanted to ask, I wanted to deepen your depression by asking, or maybe you can lift ours, by asking about a fourth factor which hasn't yet been in evidence among the many populists who haven't got power in Western Europe and maybe defeat, maybe will defeat Trump because of the power institutions in, in the United States. But in a lot of the successful populist countries, for example, in Eastern Europe and in Turkey and others, there's another dimension to this. Most of your talk was sociological. How is it that this became attractive? How does, what can be done to lessen the attractiveness of these tendencies. But populists in power, at least several, are as wise as we are on this, and they are taking uh, systematic institutional measures mm -hmm. to entrench their people, their programs, their ways of doing things, in ways which are not simply personal, 
but institutionally mm. hoping to be invulnerable to a sort of liberal democratic response yeah. or resurgence. And maybe the answer is still sociological. If the people turn against them, that'll be washed away. That's not what they're bargaining on, and I'm just interested to hear what you might say about that. Yeah. Well, I think that it is what you talking about is a tremendous danger. I mean, I don't think we can, at the moment, do anything about <clears throat> Erdogan turning Turkey into a personal thief and, and Putin and Russia and so on. <clears throat> I don't think maybe we can now do anything about Viktor Orban in Hungary. See? I think he has stacked the deck to the point where, I mean, also and also they the kind of uh, suspicion of foreigners is much greater. I mean, there's a there's a party even, believe it or not, to the right of, of Orban, right, the Olympic party. <clears throat> but in, let's take Poland. You know, it's the the game is not yet over. There still is another another model of <clears throat> of Poland that's that's there, and I can see some of the even under the present uh, you know uh, PIS uh, regime. In places like Gdańsk, there are real attempts to resist this and to refer back to this the earlier model of the Rzeczpospolita, of the of, of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and so on. So um, this is not the defeat is not inevitable here. But where where it's actually happened and we have an established regime, like in Russia, and there's not nothing we can do about it. I don't think. It has to be some long-term hope that the population will eventually revolt against this. So we have to stop. We have to stop our different democracies from falling over that tipping point. But that is a very important tipping point. Yeah, I, I kidnapped the microphone before it goes to the other side. Uh, my name is Christophe Gerben. I'm, I'm from Ovive, Geneva. So I had a short trip to come here. Uh, you, you illustrated the three clusters of issues uh, with recent examples and even uh, f sometimes futuristic or close future related examples. Could you, could you do the, the, the same exercise, of course, <laughs> shortly, with respect to the Weimar Republic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because I think there are... Uh, many elements today that mm -hmm. are uh, uh, comparable to the situation in the interwar period. Mm. Uh, fragmentation, populism, uh, humiliation of great parts of the population, uh, concentration of wealth, which is, uh, according to certain economists, comparable to mm -hmm. the figures at that time. And we all know how it ended up. And related to this exercise of trying to, to put into a concrete context your clusters of issues, your three uh, clusters of issues, the role of intellectuals who, uh, like Carl Schmitt, for example, uh, mm. were well aware about uh, how the Republic worked. They, they, they wrote uh, books on, on the constitution of Weimar, and then suddenly, uh, turned completely into a direction which was uh, mm. the one uh, we all know. Yeah. No, it's a very good question you're asking, but I think you have to make a really big leap out of our situation in order, and I can try to briefly touch that in a minute, but our situation in most of these Western democracies I'm talking about is a situation in which the past of the post-war period is very important because certain markers were set down about <clears throat> welfare states and so on, which has then been moved away from, they've been undermined by neoliberalism and so on. But at the same time, their being there is part of what, as it were, colors this sense of frustration at non-citizen efficacy and this sense of responding to yes we can and uh, being very angry when it turns out that we that we can't. None of that was true in the Weimar period. In the Weimar period you had, indeed there were certain gains of social democracy which really were partly by the, by the Bismarck government, certain elements of the welfare state, but you had a regime 
whose legitimacy was challenged by many, many people, including influential people, including people who were you know, highly educated and so on, from the very beginning. <laughs> First of all, so the very legitimacy of this kind of democracy was, which had swept away elements of hierarchy, the kings and so on, and emperor, was challenged. And then it also carried the immense cross of the Versailles, the diktat of Versailles, which people could be worked up into a real sort of lather against, as is terribly unfair and so on. Right? So this regime had these immense weights. Thirdly, it had no, it was no unity of what could be considered, broad, in a broad sense, the left. In other words, the Communist Party had a very important role, but it was miles away from the, the, you know, at that point, the socialists were considered social fascists by them. We don't have the situation of the Front National, I mean, sorry, the, the Front Commun, the Front Populaire in France in the late 30s. So you have uh, so many strikes against it that it took simply the deep depression to send it over the, over the edge. So it's a very different situation. But what the general lesson I draw from this is that you really have to try to get into the particular epoch and the particular society in order to see what the identity factors are that are moving people in one way or another. And that's really a different world from us. Thanks, I'm Nick Cheeseman from the UK. Also came a long way today and had a flight delayed and they lost our luggage, but still we were determined to come and see you. Um, <laughs> and you didn't disappoint. It struck me when you were talking that you know, the, the three dimensions of degeneration you were talking about, you know, were all there in a classic theory of democracy that you know much better than me, right? Tocqueville's democracy in America, the three of the classic kind of dimensions is yeah. the disenchantment of the citizenship, the rise of populist leaders, the tyranny of the majority, but also in a, in a little known section most people don't read, there's a whole wonderful story about how democracy will make the media uh, terrible and it will make books terrible and everything will go to the lowest common denominator. So he predicted, you know, 150 years ago, the rise of um, mm. reality TV. Now, if, <laughs> if Tocqueville, in a way, was right about those, if these are not moments of our time, these are actually, you know, major features of democracy that are fundamentally dangerous, um, I guess the question would be, and it taps into a little bit what was just asked, is this a new moment in which a certain set of factors have come together to kind of prove those dangers right? Or is this something cyclical? Is it the case that every 20 or 30 years we have a crisis of democracy, we worry about it, we identify these kinds of themes, it goes wrong, there's a corrective moment, we have a rebirth of democracy, we love democracy again, it's great, and then, you know, because it seems to me, and I think maybe this is what the previous speaker was picking up, that we don't have that nice straight line, right? We sometimes yeah. like to imagine it back into history, that we've just had this constant process of democratization. Yeah. But every 20, 30 years, we've had massive democratic failures in big parts of the world that have then been resuscitated. And to some extent, our disappointment now comes from having the most countries in the world ever holding elections and at least claiming to be democracy. So we're failing from a really high point. So in a nutshell, the question is, is this something different? and therefore more dangerous than what we've seen in the past? Or is this a natural part of democracy that will correct itself in 20 years? Well, I think that, that in one way, yes, and, but in a very a more important way, no. That is, <clears throat> that is the, the crisis always has features that were quite unprecedented. For instance, our existing crisis, and I, I just touched on it uh, very briefly, we have the most extraordinary recognition of diversity that has ever existed in history, and certainly much greater than the 1830s in, in the United States, right? Uh, going along with, in the United States, certain re-editing of what, what Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. I mean, when you get <clears throat> sort of the so-called Christian right and so on, a very strong moralistic view about homosexuality and so on. You get something that Tocqueville would have recognized right away. But this is happening in a society in which gay rights are perhaps, you know, more, more recognized legally than, well, not nor than anywhere else, but certainly in the leading edge, right? Not to, just to speak of that among many other kinds of, of uh, diversity. So there are 
and th there are features about each of these crises, and 30 years is too fast. I mean, maybe it would be a longer, uh, <clears throat> a longer cycle. There are features of this crisis, and this is a pendant to what I was saying about the, about the, as it were, the Weimar Republic. There are features of this crisis that just didn't exist before. So we, yeah, I think there's always going to be crises because what I was trying to explain is that there are susceptibilities to the generation which are bound at some time to crop up in the best possible circumstances. But when they turn up to turn out to crop up, some very important things have changed, the technology, the et cetera, which means that the solutions have to be totally you know, worked out from scratch. So thank you very, very much uh, for, uh, I, I mean, this is a uh, odd statement to make for a depressing talk, but uh, that's not what I want to actually say. What I was going to say was, in a way, what uh, we've heard today are two um, uh, talks which both set out democratic agendas, democratic agendas which need uh, thinking about, which need um, both intellectual reflection and political practice. And I think that's a conversation that we need to continue. We may probably take a step back tomorrow with the uh, final keynote of the conference, which is Professor Calhoun's con uh, uh, talk on populism, it may take us. Well, I will assert that's the solution. You will assert that that is the solution <laughs> and will not distinguish between good and bad populism, so we'll see. But so this is an invitation to join us tomorrow uh, at 6.30 for uh, another and the third uh, keynote of the uh, conference. And thank you very, very much once again for accepting our invitation. Thank you.